Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on Genesis, the book of the beginning, we sometimes call it. This particular lesson is lesson number 11 in that series for June 11 of 2022, entitled Joseph, Master of Dreams. And if you know something about the story of Joseph, there were a lot of dreams involved. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we have come together today to consider another one of these incredible stories. We wonder how much you were involved in all the details. Someday we'll have a chance to, for you to tell us exactly how you were involved with all of this material, but it's fascinating as it is. Help us to understand what you want us to learn Help us to understand the implications of each of these events. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The story of Joseph in, in Genesis 37 to 50, that's a big chunk of Genesis, is incredible. Even movies and Broadway plays have been made about it. This, this story occupies more space in the book of Genesis than does any other patriarch, except maybe Abraham, depending on Abraham's is sort of spread out with other things in it. But nevertheless, Joseph, the firstborn of Rachel, is only one of the 12 sons born to Jacob. However, he, presented in, he is presented in Genesis as one of the great patriarchs following Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob himself. I can get my, we discovered two very important truths from this story, and I just want to mention these right up front because they are so prominent. One, God fulfills his promises, and two, God can work in spite of evil to bring about good, and we'll talk about that in a moment. There can be no question about the fact that God endowed Joseph with the ability to understand, master, and interpret dreams. Now, whether that was uh, a case of, you know, endowing him with some ability just at the time the dream was given or whether he had that inherent and in early in his life, we don't know. He certainly knew how to make his way around dreams. This has not only led to his conflict with other members in the family, his brothers especially, but also led to his rise to power in Egypt. So it had good effects and it had bad effects. So let's begin to talk about the lesson for this week, Joseph and his dreams. Jim? Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 to 9. Jacob continued to live in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived. And this is the story of Jacob's family. Joseph, a young man of 17, took the care of the sheep and goats with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha his father's concubines. He brought bad reports to his father about what his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than all his other sons because he had been born to him when he was old. He made a long robe with, with full sleeves, traditional translations say many colors, footnote robe with full sleeves or decorated robe. So the what that means is that the the words that are used there could have multiple meanings. It's, it's like any of the ancient uh, languages. Um, when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than he loved them, them, they hated their brother so much that they would not speak to him in a friendly manner. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. He said, listen, the dream I had Excuse me, listen to the dream I had. We were all in the field lying up, tying up, tying up sheaves of wheat. Then my sheaf got up and stood up straight. Yours formed a circle round mine and bowed down to it. Do you think you are going to be a king and ruler over us? His brothers asked. So they hated him even more because of his dreams and because of what he had said about, about them. Then Joseph had another dream and said to his brothers, I had another dream in which I saw the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bow down, bowing down to me. American Bible Society, 1992. Good news translation. Now, I don't think there's any other possible explanation for those two dreams except that they were given by God. I don't, 
No, I've never heard anyone su suggest anything, any other possible explanation. Do you think Moses, do you think Joseph was wise to tell his brothers or was yeah. this supposed to be for personal consumption? Right. You know, it, it just, yeah. few, as the text was, says, it fueled their anger. Yeah. What was his age at that time? 17. 17. Well, less than 17 because yeah. Yeah. he sold him at age 17. Yeah. Well, there's no question about the fact that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. He even made a very special tunic with long sleeves, as we mentioned. Note the tradition trans traditional translation say it was a coat of many colors. However, long sleeves is probably the correct translation. His brothers obviously interpreted this to mean that Joseph was going to be considered preeminently as the firstborn in the family. And that's because there are other passages in Scripture where princes and princesses were given robes of the of the same name, tunics of the same name, and so uh, that's that idea where that idea comes from. So why did God give Joseph those dreams? What if Joseph had not had those dreams? Weren't those dreams the primary reason the brothers hated him and sold him into slavery in Egypt? Well, what if he had not gone to Egypt? It's hard to understand how this whole sequence could be anything other than God's direct intervention in the lives of this family. When Joseph the, told... The only thing, it, it appears that he was not bragging. I think he was just naive. Yeah. He, he was naive. Uh, but he, he, um, I don't think he was, he was bragging. You know, no, I, 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 but he was just naive and it just got yeah, on to teenager. him. Teenager. Right, right, there yeah. you are, right. When you, get, when you got the, the old man dying at, uh, what, 160 or 170 years old? It, it, no, at that point in time, he was, he was about 115. Well, but, but, but uh, I, his grandfather, how, how old uh, did, uh, these guys, oh, how Isaac. much immature were they at, the, at, the, at right, those ages? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. by comparison. Yes. Yeah. After life experiences. The, yeah. Uh, after the first dream is recorded in Genesis 37, 5 and 6, there came another as recorded in Genesis 37, 9, as we've already read. Ellen White states, Carrie? Yeah, I just said a sneeze. Where was I? Soon he had another dream of similar import, which he also related. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. This dream was interpreted as, readily, as readily as the first. The father who was present spoke reprovingly, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Notwithstanding the apparent severity of his words, Jacob believed that the Lord was revealing the future to Joseph. And this is from Ellen G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets, Page 210, paragraph 2. The story of what happened next is quite familiar. It's hard to believe that the older brothers of Joseph could have hated him so much that they were ready to kill him. Dwayne? Genesis 37, 12 to 36. I what? should tell you, let me just interrupt a bit here again. This is a more or less continuous story, so we're going to get a lot of scripture in our lesson today because... You know, the story just goes on. It's hard, hard to leave out any of the parts. One day, when Joseph's brothers had gone to Shechem to take care of their father's flock, Joseph arrived at Shechem and was wandering about in the country when a man saw him and asked him, What are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers who are taking care of their flock, he answered. Can you tell me where they are? The man said, They've already left. I heard them say that they were going to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Let me interrupt for a second. That's a long way that Joseph walked to get there. It's a long way. And Shechem remembers the place where two of his brothers, including two that are there keeping their sheep, had murdered everybody in that town, all the men of that town. So I don't know. That happened already? It's earlier in the text. I, yeah, I think so. Pretty sure. Yeah. So they knew these guys as well. And so to think about when this happened, I mean, it, probably there were watering holes or there were wells in certain places. And probably it was only at those times when people would gather around, what are you doing? Oh, well, we're going over to Dothan. I mean, 
you wouldn't be telling another shepherd whose flocks are, you know, five miles away that you're going to Dothan. This had to be at a watering hole. I, I'm all, I, at least that's the way it seems to me. So, and Joseph went on to Dothan. They saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted against him and decided to kill him. Yeah. And uh, there, later, we're going to find out that uh, Simeon was the one who originally suggested that. They said to one another, here comes that dreamer. Come on now, let's kill him and throw his body into one of the dry wells. We can say that a wild animal killed him. Then we will see what becomes of his dreams. Reuben heard them and tried to save Joseph. Let's not kill him, he said. Just throw him into this well in the wilderness, but don't hurt him. He said this plan to save him from them and send him back to his father. When Joseph came up to his brothers, they ripped off his long robe with full sleeves. Then they took him and threw him into the well, which was dry. Now, there were how many brothers that had? Ten of them, right? Benjamin, well, Benjamin it, was not there. Huh? Yeah, so Benjamin. They, no, but, but they were all together, weren't there twelve? Right. Yes, okay, well, so but they, hold on. The the younger brothers, the, the brothers, the brothers who, well, I don't know. I mean, earlier it talked about Joseph working with the, the sons of the concubines, so they may have been in a separate group. But I, I don't well, know. It, well, there was... He, were, whatever it is, Joseph was outnumbered. Yeah, ten to oh, one. Absolutely. <laughs> and it, so it, was Reuben. It was either it was either <laughs> six to one or ten to one. Yeah. While they were eating, they suddenly saw a group of Ishmaelites traveling from Gilead to Egypt. And I'm going to ask a question again. Did this just suddenly happen by chance? Their camels were loaded with spices and resins. Jesus, Judah, said to the, his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brother and covering up the murder? Let's sell him to these Ishmaelites. Then we won't have to hurt him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed, and when the, some Midianite traders came by, the brothers pulled Joseph out of the well and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Um, I'm sorry I'm getting carried away here. Um, Who's reading the next section? Go ahead and take well, off. right? Dwayne. No, yeah, but I, I mean, uh, all Dwayne. of these brothers have families. They're old enough to have their own families yes. by now. And they're still talking this way. Like that, and working together. With, with children, some of them probably. Yes. Well, we, know, we know Judah had children by this time. Well, when Reuben came back to the well and found that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes in sorrow. He returned to his brother and said, The boy is not there. What am I going to do? And he was the one who was the firstborn. Then they killed a goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They took the robe to their father and said, We found this. Found this. Does it belong to your son? So again, I'm thinking, so obviously when they decided to sell, when the Ishmaelites came along, they decided to sell Joseph to... Reuben must not have been there. He recognized, of course, Jacob recognized it and said, Yes, it is his. Some wild animal has killed him. My son Joseph has been torn to pieces. Meanwhile, in Egypt, the Midianites had sold Joseph to Potiphar, one of the king's officers, who was the captain of the palace guard. And I never have figured out why it goes back and forth between calling him Midianites and Ishmaelites. But anyway... It's interesting to notice that three of the brothers distinguished themselves from the others in various ways. Reuben, one, suggested they throw Joseph into a pit so that he could come back later and rescue Joseph. Two, Simeon was the one who first suggested that they do something to Joseph, maybe even kill him. Three, Judah was the one who proposed that they sell Joseph to the merchants instead of killing him or leaving him to die. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Charles. Judas have not changed. Uh, Old mm -hmm. Testament, New Testament is all the same. Sell <laughs> or silver. Meanwhile, Joseph with his captors was on the way to Egypt. As the caravan joined southward toward the borders of Canaan, the boy could discern in the distant hills among which lay his father's tents. Bitterly he wept had thought that loving father in the loneliness and affliction. Again, the scene at Dothan came up before him. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances bent upon him. The stinging, insulting words that had melted his agonizing 
entreaties entreaties were ringing in his ears with a trembling heart he looked forward to the future what a change in situation from the tenderly cherished son to the despised despised and helpless slave alone and friendless what would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going for a time joseph gave himself up to uncontrollable grief and terror but in the providence of god even this experience was to be a blessing to him he had learned a few hours that which in a years few hours, in yeah. a few years that which might not otherwise have taught him his father strong and tender as his love had been had done him wrong by his parti- partiality and indulgences this unwise preference had angered his brothers and provoked them to the cruel deed that had separated him from his home its effects were manifest also in his own character faults have been encouraged that were now to be corrected he was becoming self sufficient and exacting accustomed to the tenderness of his father's care he felt that he was unprepared to cope with the difficulties before him in bitterness uncared for life in a strange a slave and slave these thoughts thought turned to his father's god in his childhood he had been taught to love and fear him often in his father's tent he had listened to the story of the vision that jacob saw as he fled from his home and exile and fugitive he had been told of the lord's promises to jacob and how they had been fulfilled how in the hours of need the angels of god had come to instruct comfort and protect him and he had learned of the love of god in providing for men a redeemer now all these precious lessons came vividly before him joseph believing that god of his fathers would be his god he then and there gave himself fully to the lord and prayed that the keeper of israel would be with him in the land of his exile his soul thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to god under all circumstances to uh, to the act as become a subject of the king of heaven he would serve the la- lord with undivided heart he would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity one day's experience had been the turning point in joseph's life its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man thoughtful courageous and self possessed ellen uh, white patrick and prophets page 213 paragraph 214 yeah what a what a story what a story wow That, oh. that one that one sent one sentence in the middle he had learned in a few hours that mm. which years might not otherwise have taught him yeah so you know this was a a life terrible changing. experience but life changing yep but he yeah. had apparently had some good background there good yep. upbringing yeah uh, yeah even though he was spoiled it's terrible look at that last sentence it's terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man thoughtful courageous and self-possessed at the age of 17 very quickly right within mm. an hour's time yeah mm. hmm. are we ever tempted to lose our temper and become so upset by what someone else does that we might want to destroy them in one way or another hmm i hope that never happens and then suddenly there's a change in the story one chapter genesis 38 completely unrelated to joseph On a superficial reading this seems like an interruption to the story of Joseph but it is an integral part of the overall story to help us to understand something about what was going on in the lives of these brothers Judah had moved away from his family and lived with the Canaanite family 
and married Shua's daughter. Later, he got another Canaanite young woman by the name of Tamar to be the wife of his oldest son, Ur. We do not know exactly what happened to Ur or his brother Ur Onan, his second son, both of whom died of unexplained causes. The Bible says simply that God killed them. Now, we understand that in ancient times, if something happens unexpected, it's more or less assumed that God must have done it. Well, they, like the insurance policy calls it an act of God. Yeah. No, but uh, how, about, how about Aaron's two kids? Yeah, they well, were killed. that was a little different. They were, they were different, right? Yeah. But who... Later, Tamar began to fear that she was going to be left without a husband, so she pretended to be a prostitute. Jacob entered intercourse with her, and she became pregnant with twins. You died. One of whom ended up being the ancestor of Jesus. And mm -hmm. you can read about that in Matthew 1, 2 to 5. Yeah, so that is Judah instead of Jacob had right. intercourse with, with Tamar. Yeah, you Did you, I write, you did I say Jacob? Oh, I'm right. sorry. No, that's Judah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Being the fourth son of Leah, Judah was certainly no more than three years or so older than Joseph. And, and Gordon, you can take that, Barry, that section. Which would have... Uh, which would make him about 20 years old at the time Joseph was sold, and their reference is given. This is from the Bible commentary, by the way. Between Joseph's sale as a slave and Jacob's migration to Egypt lay 22 years, so that Judah was about 42 years old when the family moved to Egypt. At that time, he not only had the three sons mentioned in chapter 38, but was apparently a grandfather as well, as chapter 46, 12 seems to imply. If this be correct, his sons Ur, Onan, and Shelah must have been born before Joseph was sold, since yeah. they themselves yeah. had already reached marriageable ages when the events involving Tamar occurred. And Tamar's son, Therez, had two sons of his own when the family moved to Egypt. These observations oblige us to conclude that some of Jacob's sons must have married while very young, as opposed to Jacob, Jacob and Isaac, yeah. who married at very old ages. Judah could not have been more than 14 years old at the birth of his oldest son. That's kind of frightening. Yeah. <laughs> his oldest son, Ur, nor Ur more than 13 at his marriage to Tamar. Wow. Really young. Can't even imagine. The birth of Judah's twin sons by the by his daughter-in-law, Tamar, must have taken place within two years after Ur, Ur's death. Pharaoh's cannot have been more than 14 years old when Hezron and Hamuel were born, apparently also as twins, before the departure from Canaan. Such early marriages are by no means uncommon in certain parts of the Orient, even today. In the case of Jacob's family, they may represent Canaanite influence. These considerations make it virtually certain that Judah was a married man and a father at the time of Joseph's sale, and that part of the narrative of chapter 38 had already taken place from yeah. the Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 434. I think that helps us to understand a little better some parts of the Joseph story. These facts are interesting, as Gordon mentioned a moment ago, in light of the fact that Jacob himself did not leave home until he was 70 and did not get married until he was 77. It seems like the Canaanite environment was having a major impact on Jacob's family. And we, we have to assume that all of the brothers except uh, Joseph married Canaanite wives. And Joseph, of course, married an Egyptian. 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 And Which what was... Worse. Yeah. <laughs> This is another story in which God, in one way or another, brought good out of evil. So returning now to the story of Joseph, we find him a slave in Egypt. During 10 years, he learned the Egyptian language, their customs, and had become an excellent businessman working under Potiphar. Then there is a story of Potiphar's wife trying to seduce Joseph, and that's Genesis 39. And without going into the sordid details of that, did Potiphar believe his wife's story about Joseph? If he had really believed that Joseph had attacked his wife and tried to rape her, what would he have done with Joseph? And here's Helen White's comments. 
Joseph suffered for his integrity, for his temp tempter revenged herself by accusing him of a foul crime and causing him to be thrust into prison. Had Potiphar believed his wife's charge against Joseph, the young Hebrew would have lost his life. But the modesty and uprightness that had uniformly characterized his contact conduct were proof of his innocence, and yet to save the reputation of his master's house, he was abandoned to disgrace and bondage. Patriarchs and Prophets 218, paragraph 1. Once again, Joseph redeemed himself by his excellent character, his hard work, and his reliability. Then we come to the next section, Genesis 40, verse 1 to 41, verse 36. These two chapters recount the stories of Joseph's rise to power. While caring for Pharaoh's former butler and baker in prison, God helped Joseph interpret their dreams. That's a familiar story. His interpretations proved to be correct. Two more years went by, and then Pharaoh had those incredible dreams recounted in Genesis 41. Suddenly, the butler remembered his own experience while in prison and suggested to Pharaoh that Joseph be called. Once again, we are led to ask some significant questions. Did God send those dreams to the butler and the baker? I mean, <laughs> they, he must have. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to explain this in any other way. It was interpreting those dreams that led to Joseph being called by Pharaoh. Why do you think it was necessary for Joseph to remain in prison for another two years before God chose to rescue him? There was probably another force acting there yeah, in something. this great controversy. Well, what did Joseph learn during his time at Potiphar's household and in prison that helped to prepare him for his later work as prime minister of Egypt? What do you think he learned? The language. He certainly learned the Egyptian language. And he was associating with people who were high level in the Egyptian society, right? So he must have learned about what was acceptable in that environment, about the habits of Egyptian royalty. Um, but, but to me, it, that his faith was distinct, his lifestyle was absolutely distinct from what these folk were practicing, and he would not give in. Yes, I, think this I, I agree with that completely. But it, still, at the same time, he could learn about what, oh, absolutely. what was yes. going on with them. Yes. Think he got discouraged while he was in prison? He might have questioned, but... Who wouldn't have gotten <laughs> discouraged? Yes, exactly. <laughs> However, he was in a supervisory kind of position. Maybe that would help. Start there. Yeah. But despite this change in circumstances, Joseph once again assured those around him, including Pharaoh, that it was... God that gave him the power to understand dreams. And finally, Pharaoh concluded, Jim? Genesis chapter 41, verses 39 and 40. The king said to Joseph, God has shown you all this, so it is obvious that you have a greater wisdom and insight than anyone else. I will put you in charge of my country, and all my people will obey your orders. Your authority will be second only to mine. I now appoint you governor over all Egypt. Good News Bible. Question. Yes. How much uh, did uh, King Pharaoh know this God that he's talking about here? Well, That's a good question. The butler, the butler told him. I think he realized that this was a different God that they were used to. Yeah, yeah. Because they had never, they've never <coughs> dealt with something like this before. The question I ask when I read that, sen read that last sentence especially, what did Pharaoh say to his wife when he went home and told her that story? I'm not Pharaoh, I'm sorry, Potiphar. Potiphar uh, what did Potiphar say to his wife? You remember Joseph? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> he's, he's, now in, he's now in charge. <laughs> right? He's my boss. <laughs> he's my boss. That's my word. Wow. What an incredible story. And nothing else, the story of Joseph is a story of amazing reversals. Joseph from, went from being a petted son to slave to top manager to prisoner to palace, saving his adopted nation and his own family from starvation. Wow. Sounds like the life of a politician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
What were the background conditions that made it possible for this story to take place? But the guy had integrity. That's one yeah, thing that's, 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 you don't find it among very many other politicians in yeah. today's market. Well, this helps us to understand some of the details. The people who ruled Egypt that time were the Hyksos, a nomadic Asian people, probably Semites, almost certainly Semites, that means descendants of Shem, while the Egyptians themselves were descendants of Ham, who controlled Egypt from 1720 B.C. until 1560 B.C. And that, of course, was the time of Joseph. Hyksos comes from the Greek word Hyksos, or huxos in Greek. It is from the Egyptian word, which I won't even try to pronounce, H-Q apostrophe S apostrophe S-W, meaning ruler of the lands of the nomads. And that's from Collins' English Dictionary, 21st century edition. They ruled Egypt from a city in the eastern delta of the Nile, not far from Goshen. And why is that important as the story develops? That's what the Israelites spent 400 years. How much do we know about the background of this story from extra-biblical sources? Why is it there is no archaeological evidence of any or any trace of Israelites to be found in Egypt or the Sinai Peninsula? Actually, in the last few years, an area in the Nile Delta has been excavated that looks like it might be a place where some of the Jews lived. And if you want to learn about that, Look under Google or Amazon if you have a computer. Look for the expression Patterns of Evidence. It's a book and a um, DVD movie, a documentary. Does that shake your faith if we do not have archaeological evidence? To find evidence of the Exodus, should we, looking, should we be looking in the area of the former area of Midian in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, as some scholars now believe? There's pretty good evidence that uh, at least part of their wanderings, Israel, later Israelite wanderings, were over there. Well, okay, now some more questions. Was God responsible for the famine that occurred in the days of Joseph? Since he, he, or we say, well, did he cause it, or did he, was he ha able to respond to the famine? You know, we say responsible, really, means able to respond. But did he cause the famine? Not likely. I mean, does God manipulate things at that level? Either he caused it or he allowed it. Yeah. I agree with the latter. Yeah. God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. That solves an awful lot of problems with the stories in the Bible. Yeah. Since Egypt is watered primarily by the Nile, and since the headwaters of the Nile are in East Africa, did the famine spread to all of Eastern Africa as well? I mean, those headwaters come from Burundi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, I mean, Sudan, all those areas. It starts in Congo, I think, the river. Yeah, there's, there's even a little bit of it might be coming from Congo. Yeah, I crossed it. Yeah. <laughs> Would we know anything about the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if they had not become segregated in Egypt, away from the influence of the Egyptians and Canaanites? And remember, we've talked about this before. That was because of Abraham's experience earlier with Pharaoh. Do we dare to say Abraham's lie yes. became a blessing, even? Yes. <laughs> Was God manipulating conditions on this earth? Or was he merely able to see into the future and know what was going to happen? Why not the latter? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm asking you to think about it. it. The, the infinite one. Who, who, we're all finite. Can you think of any finite being that are going to tell us what the limits are of the infinite? No. No, of course not. But people still question, you know. Oh, sure. How close is the relationship between heaven and this earth? How often are events that take place on this earth affected by the work of angels, even God himself? And, of course, the other half of that question is, how often are the events that happen on this earth caused by the devil? Yeah. Well, was God playing favorites? Gary? Uh, that looks like from E.G. White, I guess. Yes. Right there. Those uh, letters. In early life, just as they were passing from youth to manhood, Joseph and Daniel were separated from their homes and carried as captives to heathen lands. 
especially was Joseph, subject to the temptations that attend great changes of fortune. In his father's home, a tenderly cherished child, in the house of Potiphar, a slave, and a confident and companion, a man of affairs, educated by study, observation, contact with men, in Pharaoh's dungeon, a prisoner of state, condemned unjustly without hope of vindication or prospect of release, called at a great crisis to the leadership of the nation, what enabled him to preserve his integrity. Wow. A shepherd boy tending his father's flocks, Joseph's pure and simple life had favored the development of both physical and mental power. By communion with God through nature and the study of the great truths handed down as a sacred trust from father to son, he had gained strength of mind and firmness of principle. In the crisis in, of his life, when making that terrible journey from his childhood home in Canaan to the bondage which awaited him in Egypt, looking for the last time on the hills that hid the tents of his kindred, Joseph remembered his father's God. He remembered the lessons of his childhood and his soul thrilled with the resolve to prove himself true, ever to act as became a subject of the King of Heaven. From Ellen mm. White Education, 51.3, 52.3. I don't know, he must have been able to communicate with those people that took him down to Egypt. I always ask the question, he, they passed very close to the place where his father was living. Yeah. Why, couldn't he, why didn't he say to them, look, if you take me right over there, my father will give you way more money for me than anybody will ever give you down in Egypt. If he was on an adventure, took it as an adventure. Adventure. <laughs> I don't think he wanted it that adventure. I suspect that the Canaanites were, uh, or the traders were on a mission. Yeah. We've got to get there by such and such a time. That's you know, possible. And, you know, we don't have time to divert to the side and sell you. But they were looking for money and yeah. a lot of money might have... They were looking for a lot of money in Egypt. Yeah. Well, according to Gary A. Rensberg, and he wasn't the first one who thought this up. Some other people had come up with this idea earlier. Um, and if we, I wish we all understood Hebrew because this would be much clearer if we, we understood Hebrew. There were key words that would point this out. Uh, he came from, he was working at Rutgers University at the time, and his book entitled The Redaction or the Edit, the Ed. Redaction of Genesis. Redaction of Genesis, but another word for redaction would be... Editor. Editing of, re of Genesis, maybe. The Joseph story builds to a focal point or a pivotal po pivot point at the Genesis 45, 1 through 3, after which the themes and stories are repeated in reverse order, thus creating the chiastic structure. In Genesis 45, 1 through 3, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. There are six episodes... You can see the progress that goes from A, B, C, D, E, F, followed by six parallel episodes, F prime, E prime, D prime, C prime. We'll look at that in just a moment in reverse order. Now, how do you think, I mean, that's almost a poetic kind of thing. How did that happen? It's beyond it, poetry. Yeah. The result is a neatly constructed palestrope for a symmetrical structure in what is already a well-unified story. Though not indicated in the chart, each of the matching episodes is linked by a series of keywords, and, and that's what I already mentioned. The, the keywords are in Hebrew, and you can't do that into English. The Joseph story, and look, look at how this develops. Duane, you want to help us with that? The Joseph story. A, Joseph and his brothers. Jacob and Joseph part. B, there's an interlude. Joseph is not present. So he's down there as, as a slave now in Egypt. Go ahead. And C, there's a reversal. Joseph, guilty. Potiphar's wife, innocent. I mean, why did that happen? You know, he shouldn't have been, he wasn't the guilty one, but things were turned upside down. That's a reversal, okay? Then Joseph becomes a hero in Egypt. Okay, and then? Followed by two trips to Egypt. 
So now his brothers have to make two different trips down there. And then a final test. And we're going to talk about that uh, next week. The focal point. Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. And then working your way back again. We have the conclusion of the test. And what was the conclusion of the test? Joseph gave him all that stuff and said, go home and bring my father back here. Okay. There are two tellings of migration to Egypt. Yeah. Joseph, again, hero in Egypt. Reversal, Ephraim, firstborn, Manasseh, secondborn. Even though Manasseh was the firstborn, Ephraim was the secondborn, remember Jacob, when he was blessing them, crossed his hands like that. Okay, and then? Then there's again another interlude, Joseph nominally present. And finally, Joseph and his brothers, Jacob and Joseph part. So how did someone put that together in that kind of incredible thing? It's just unbelievable. Some have suggested that the life of Joseph was a type of the life of Christ. What parallels do you see? And we're going we're gonna to follow basically the, the, the stories found in the Spirit of Prophecy. That's a book by Ellen White, Volume 1, 157 to 159. Now let's look at these and think about this as we do this very carefully. Charles? Joseph was arrested and suffered because he was faithful. So was Jesus. Joseph illustrated Christ. And then this, now we're going to read the section from Ellen White. Go ahead. Joseph illustrated Christ. Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. He was rejected and despised because his acts were righteous. And his consistent self-denying life was a continual rebuke upon those who professed piety but whose lives were corrupt. Joseph's integrity and virtue were fiercely assailed, and she who would lead him angry, astray, Potiphar's wife, could not prevail. Therefore, her hatred was strong against the virtue and integrity which she could not corrupt, and she testified falsely against him. The innocent suffered because of his righteousness. He was cast into prison because of his virtue. Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Book 1, page 150. So, so think about that. What a contrast. You know, think about what happened to Joseph down there, you know, and two experiences with his brothers and then with Potiphar's wife. And then, of course, contrast the experiences we're all familiar with, all the things that happened to Jesus. I, I cannot help it but make a quick comment. Um, what do people have against such beautiful writings? Yeah. No, really, even among Adventism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just because Ellen White had written this, that we don't want this. Is so beautiful that we're studying all through this lesson. You yeah. know, here, how beautiful and yeah. yet we don't want to accept this. Now, Potiphar was under the pharaoh, right? Right. Yeah. Now, uh, surely Potiphar must have had some inkling of what, what, the, what his wife was like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But maybe he, Potiphar was concerned about his own position standing in relationship to pharaoh. pharaoh. And so he had to keep the thing uh, <laughs> from... Uh, yeah. Because uh, otherwise, if you if you can't c control your wife, how can you control yeah. all my the stuff I've given? I mean, that's just a, one yeah. way of looking at it. it. May not be, but it's uh, well, kind of fascinating. Joseph was sold to his enemies by his family. Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples. Gordon, the short sentences. Joseph was sold to his enemies by his own brethren for a small sum of money. The Son of God was sold to his bitterest enemies by one of his own disciples. Mm -hmm. Same paragraph as uh, what Charles read from. from. Yeah, from Ellen White. <clears throat> Jesus was humble, meek, and refused to use his power to fight his enemies. Joseph humbly served God in whatever place he found himself. I mean, mm -hmm. you just, you, you know, we, we know that he was respected as being a great manager under Potiphar, you wonder what all he did. 
you know, one I saw one group that said they suggested that Mo, that Joseph would go around and he would say to Potiphar, you know, there's a good place to buy over here to do this, buy this. Or this. Who knows what all he did as manager? Do we have any evidence that he did any of that for Jacob back before he became a slave? I don't, rem I don't recall no. reading anything like that. He had to have some, some basis for doing this. Yeah. Well, he was probably a good student, even at a very young age, of human nature. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jim, Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus was meek and holy. His life was un me, his life of unexampled self-denial, goodness and holiness. He was not guilty of any wrong, yet false witnesses were hired to testify against him. He was hated because he had been faithful reprover, excuse me, a faithful reprover of sin and corruption. Wow. Joseph and Jesus were both stripped of their coats. Joseph's brethren stripped him of his coat of many colors. The executioners of Jesus cast lots for his seamless coat. Yeah. Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him, but they finally sold him as a slave because they were jealous of him. The Jewish leaders arrested Jesus and arranged for his trial and crucifixion because they were jealous of his miraculous powers and his influence with the people. I, I just, you know, like, like Charles said, I, I, as I read this kind of stuff, I think, wow. I mean, what kind of machinations and, and discussions did the especially the Sadducees, but also the Pharisees have. I mean, as, as bitter as the Pharisees were against Jesus, <clears throat> at least they didn't have, their, many of their views were similar to Jesus. The Sadducees, when they came together, and they didn't believe in the resurrection, they didn't believe there was any afterlife, and so forth like this, they didn't believe in angels. What, what did they say to each other about Jesus? I just <clears throat> they were driven by power <clears throat> and money. Yeah. Okay, you want to read that next session, uh, Carrie? Yes. Uh, it's from E.G. White. Joseph's brethren purposed to kill him, but were finally content to sell him as a slave to prevent his becoming greater than themselves. They thought they had placed him where there would be no more trouble with his <laughs> Yeah and where there would not be a possibility of their fulfillment. But the very course which they had pursued, God overruled to bring about that which they designed never should take place, that he should have dominion over them. Wow. The chief priests and elders were jealous of Christ, that he would draw the attention of the people away from themselves to him. Let me interrupt for a second. <clears throat> Try to imagine if you're trying to get people get their attention away from Jesus to you, and you're an ordinary human being under those circumstances, I mean, they must have been incredibly frustrated. Yeah. Well, and they were dealing, and then finally, it, after he raised Lazarus back to life, yeah. that, was, that was a death knell. Yeah. It just, uh, and, and it, if, well, if, if the world gets, word gets out about this guy, Jesus, yeah. We're going to be out of a job. Is really yeah. what, what the no, uh, between the lines. Also, this was Pentecost, and this was the time of uh, Passover. Passover. But there, there were people from all over the then world. Yeah. And Caiaphas, it, it is expedient that one, one man should, should die for the nation. Yeah. Then the entire nation perish. What a prophecy! Comes mm, yeah. To. Okay. They knew that he was doing greater works than they ever had done or ever could perform, and they knew that if he was suffered to continue his teachings, he would become higher in authority than they, and might become king of the Jews. Oh dear, what if he were the king of the Jews? <laughs> yeah. They agreed together to prevent this by privately taking him and hiring witnesses to testify falsely against him, rather, that not accept him as their king, but cried out, crucify him, crucify him. The Jews thought that by taking the life of Christ, they could prevent his becoming king. But by murdering the Son of God, they were bringing about the very thing they sought to prevent. And that's from Spirit of Prophecy, <laughs> volume one, page 158, 132. I mean, look at these two situations. Yeah. You know, 
we'll sell uh, this brother. We're going to either kill this brother, we're going to sell him into, into slavery in Egypt. That way there's no possibility his dreams can ever come true. <laughs> and then, I mean, look at Jesus. Yeah. You know, I think of that song, you know, you may kill me, but you can't keep me in the ground, you know. Yeah. There's, I mean, Jesus went all the way to being killed. And still, of course, he rose. I think we have the time. I have a quick side question. Mm, yeah. We know that Pharisees, many Pharisees believed in the Lord. And uh, they, af even after the resurrection, uh, uh, Nicodemus is one. So yeah. but question is, did the, uh, any of the Sadducees ever believe in well, the Lord? Well, that's a good question. No. Let, me, let me show you a couple of passages that would, that would give you some clues. Look at Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, now this is, we're now talking about believers, right. Christians, belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised. Right. So Pharisees right. became right. Christians. But even more surprising, look at this one. Back in chapter 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests and who were the most of the priests? Pharisees. Sadducees. Sadducees yeah. Accepted the faith. Hmm. A great number of priests accepted the faith. Beautiful. Lots of Sadducees and lots of Pharisees became Christians. Well, well what, yeah. what time period was this? The, the, the reference there in that? Well, the, 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 um, the Acts 15 conference was, let me see if I can remember that exactly. It was about... 50 A.D. plus or minus, yeah. So yeah, it was some time after the crucifixion, you know, yeah. 50, 14, 15 years after the yeah. crucifixion, somewhere there. Uh, but, so. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so they, they've had some time to do some yeah. thinking. It wasn't a yeah. radical... Yeah, no. Uh, how did you remember those texts? What? <laughs> How did I remember them? Because <laughs> they're important. They are important, really. No, Acts 16 is Acts 16, and the other one is Acts. Acts 6. 15, 15, verse 5. five. That's, that was at the general conference, the first general conference. There. Oh, that's why you remember. Yeah. It's the first general conference. Yeah. And then the Acts 6, verse 7. That was earlier. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Despite the terrible treatment that both Joseph and Jesus received as a result of, the, of their treatment, they rose to take the preeminent position that God had planned for them. And in neither case did it lessen the guilt of those responsible. Duane, I think that's yours. Joseph, by being sold by his brethren into Egypt, became a savior to his, fam fa to his father's family. Yet this fact did not lessen the guilt of his brethren. The crucifixion of Christ by his enemies made him the redeemer of mankind the savior of the fallen race, and the ruler over the whole world. The crime of his enemies was just as heinous as though God's providential hand had not controlled events for his own glory and the good of man. Despite everything that Satan had, could throw at them, neither Joseph nor Jesus could be persuaded to depart in the least manner from his or his walk with God. In the end, both graciously forgave those who had done them wrong. Charles? Joseph walked with God. He would not be persuaded to deviate from the path of righteousness and transgress God's law by any in inducements or threats. And when he was imprisoned and suffered because of his innocence, he meekly bore it without murmuring. His self-control and patience in, in adversity and his unwavering fidelity are left on record for the benefit of all who should after, afterward live on the earth. When Joseph's brethren acknowledged their sin before him, he freely forgave them and showed by his acts of benevolence and love that he harbored no resent, resentful feelings of their former cruel conduct toward him. The life of Jesus, the Savior of the world, was a pattern of benevolence, goodness, and holiness. He, yet he was despised and insulted. 
mocked and derided right. for not no other reason than because of his righteous life, which was a constant rebuke to sin. His enemies would not be satisfied until he was given into their, their hands that they might put him to a shameful death. He died for the guilty race, and while suffering the most cruel torture, meekly forgave his murderers. He rose from the dead, ascended up into heaven to the Father, and received all power and authority, and returned to the earth again to impart it to his disciples. He gave gifts unto men, and all who have ever come to him repentant, confessing their sins, he has received into their favor, his favor, and freely pardoned them. And if they remain true to him, he will exalt them to his throne and make them his heirs of inheritance, which he has purchased with his blood. Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 159. Well, through those incredible experiences, not only Joseph, but Jesus especially, has been a blessing to millions of people. It's very, it's interesting that several of the most important dreams in this story are, re are repeated in one way or another. And Joseph said, a repetition of the dreams means that they're important. Was God responsible for the fact that the Midianite Karen at Van passed that spot at exactly that moment when the buzz were considering c killing Joseph? It is interesting to consider what we know about the character of Judah in contrast to Joseph. Judah apparently was so upset with what his brothers were doing that he had moved away and lived with the Canaanite family, whose daughter he married and later produced those twin sons, not knowing that the prostitute was actually Tamar, yeah. his daughter-in-law. Tamar ended up being one of the ancestors of Jesus. Joseph, by contrast, refused to even touch Potiphar's life. And did God have anything to do with Judah's experience with Tamar? Questions, Canaanite blood came into the, into the line of Jesus and that even more, more so later through Rahab and Red Ruth. So what important lessons can we learn from these incredible series of stories of this young man and all those around him, especially his brothers, etc.? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of studying these stories, of thinking trying to think of the implications of each of the events that took place. Wow. We look forward to the day in the future when we'll be able to sit down with the actual people involved with these stories and hear from them how they were involved and, and how that impacted them and get these stories in 3D living color. We just thank you for the many ways in which you bless us through the Bible. And we pray that all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.